Hey, everybody, and welcome to Azure Flash News. Uh, happy Friday the 13th. Oh, I didn't even mm. think about that. Holy cow. Okay, so happy Friday the 13th. It is, it is. Um, as my name is displayed below, my name is Rick Weinberg, and I am a cloud solution architect with Microsoft. And joining us today, as you have known him now to join our shows on a regular basis. Hey, everybody, I'm Matt Lenz. I'm also a cloud solution architect. Happy Friday. So we've got some really good stuff today. So um, we've seen some feedback. Um, based on the YouTube channel and some stuff, people are really interested in some of the APIM deployments. So yeah. Matt is kind enough to walk us through some stuff he's been working on, which is super, super exciting, right? So what this, are the topics uh, du jour? The topic du jour, well, there's two topics. Okay. The first one is you just mentioned, it's Friday the 13th. I didn't even think of that. I so know, seriously. Let, let's, let's, let's take a, a quick diatribe here. So <laughs> what's your favorite horror movie? Um, oh my gosh! Jason Voorhees and Friday oh, the Thirteenth. No, 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 no. It's got no. That doesn't do anything. I'm the kind of guy that loves a horror movie that that legit scares me. Okay. <laughs> so, so yes, since we're taking a little bit of a detour, I'm going to tell you it's either Hellraiser. I love the Hellraiser. Oh, the, the pins movie, and the needle. Yeah, the the movie, movie, the not yeah, the yeah. original, not the remakes. But the one that scared the crap out of me the most, if I can say that, is Jaws. So I saw Jaws in seventy, was it seventy nine, seventy eight ish? Yeah, that sounds that window. Frame I can't that, remember that exactly. Jaws was but I will tell you that I, everybody knows this. It's a running joke, and I think I've expressed this on Azure Flash News. I am deathly afraid of sharks, and I think that's why. You know, it's funny you say that because uh, I've, you know, you click through the channels at home, and, and all of a sudden you see you're halfway through the Jaws movie, and you get right to the scene where it's yeah. going after uh, somebody. Uh, I. Unfortunately, my kids were in the living room one time when I came across <laughs> that, and now they like they, they get timid about going in there. Oh, I do. They're afraid of sharks. Yeah, and I and do I. You have a a, rash, a fear. Of I have a very irrational fear of sharks. I tried to desensitize myself when we were in the Dominican Republic. We uh -huh. went swimming with nurse sharks, which they're nurse sharks. They're like puppy dogs, <laughs> and did nothing for me. I hate them. I hate them, and I hate them. Ah. Uh, okay. Romano Paul, if you're listening, this is a shout out to you. He was a. Uh, Somebody I've worked with at a customer. He's a former marine biologist, and he uh, he tells me it's it's ridiculous, but it's it is ridiculous. Yeah, a lot of fears like that, I suppose, kind of teeter on being irrational. Oh, there was Halloween. Halloween. Yeah, Halloween, yes, of, uh, course. of course. Yeah, I love the old Halloween movies. The, not the old Michael ones. Myers. They've made thirteen or fourteen yeah, of them yeah. now, Michael Myers. But yeah. the originals, um, I remember watching when I was younger, and you know, having these irrational fears as I would go to bed at night, and you know, hey, maybe I totally. should put a bat yeah. inside the bed, and if somebody totally. comes in, Babe Ruth them. Yeah, you know, that whole thing. But uh, fences, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, a, awesome. a little diatribe. Hey, it's so we got some good stuff today on Friday the thirteenth. Why don't you uh, tell us what you're going to share? Yes. So, um, so working on um, an effort lately to deploy um, APIs hosted on function apps, okay. different regions across the world. We love APIM, right? and, and these APIs are fronted by APIM. So we want an AP, we want an API facade. Um, on Azure, that's of course API management. Um, so the question became, well, how do we ensure um, if we're fronting our APIs with API management and our APIs are spread across different parts of the world to ensure that we get a highly performant experience when we're interacting with those APIs? So trying to avoid tr crossing the pond. Try to avoid crossing the pond. Okay. We don't want to go to a gateway that's sitting in I don't know, East US yeah. to an API that's hosted in Europe or vice versa, right? That can lead to a ill-performing experience. So from that, yeah, we created um, an architecture to try to support that. And that's what we want to go over today. Absolutely. Well, let's, can we jump right yeah, in? Yeah, put on your seatbelt. All go. right, let's giddy up. <laughs> All right, hey, got this cool view here. So um, so this is an illustration that kind of reinforces the um, architecture that we just described. And I'll go through this um, from the Legos that you see on the screen. Lego. So we've got um, Azure DNS, right? Well, so excellent. We've got a service leave that hosts, it. don't leave home without it. So I've got a domain name here, azuredemo.org, that I'm hosting on Azure DNS. It's basically just hosting Azure DNS. It doesn't play a critical role other than that, but that's what that's intended How to illustrate. Azuredemo.org, good for you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I bought it. It was only like 2500 bucks. From <laughs> I thought, you know, that sounds like a deal. Oh, that's Who doesn't funny. want azuredemo.org? Right on. Um, you know, we do so much work that having yeah, a domain name for you. to work with uh, yep. certainly helps a lot. Okay, so we've got Azure DNS hosting DNS. Um, now, what you'll notice here on the back end, and I'm going to go to the opposite end of the, the diagram here, we've okay. got our APIs hosted on function apps, and they're hosted regionally. 
Okay. So we've got one hosted in East U.S. and we've got one hosted in West Europe. These are Azure regions. We've oh, got awesome. So plus regions. So not only are we expanding, we're actually breaking out of a geopolitical boundary and right. moving into another one, which yeah. is not uncommon. Different continents here: North America, Europe. So yeah. So in this case, uh, we had a need for having these APIs in different regions, but we wanted to be performant when you awesome. interface with those APIs. We also wanted them to be protected and secured by API management. Absolutely. So. In comes API management, which is configured uh, for the premium tier. Excellent. And that premium tier allows us to replicate our API management gateways to the regions where we're hosting our APIs. So hopefully that's starting to connect some dots. We've got APIs in East US. We've got APIs in West Europe. We want to use API management as a facade for security and other purposes. We need to do some policy processing. So we're putting gateways in those corresponding regions to ensure that we've got a highly performant experience when you're interfacing with those APIs. Excellent. Now, now for the record, though, when we talk about APIM, it's made up of multiple components. So the gateway is one component, right? Yep. You have the developer portal. You right. have the management capabilities. Do. And you also have the self-hosted gateway, which you can actually run in a containerized environment on premises. Wow. Right? I didn't think about the self-hosted version. Right. Well, I'm pure play Azure I here. I love this. What it's a great cool feature that Absolutely. you can now deploy that even on premise. Or I suppose third-party clouds. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Yeah. It's just a container. Here you go. <laughs> now, we need an arbitrator. We've got gateways, as you can see, illustratively That's here. That's a good in word. Yeah. And, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's a big one. Uh, and in West Europe. So we need somebody to say, hey, if you're trying to, if you're located here and you're interfacing with this API, go there. If you're sitting here and you're interfacing with this API, go there. That's traffic manager. Okay, so that so if you had to write that on your own, that would be a lot of work, right? You'd have. I'm to not even a developer, so I'd have to do a lot uh, of Google I mean, binging to uh, <laughs> Chat GPT. Chat GPT. I, I, I right. would ask Chat GPT. Write me some code to determine a, 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 the origin of a, a request, a traffic request, right? That's right. Love something it. Something along that order. Um, now it's now it's not so hard, but still not as robust as something like traffic. Yeah, traffic manager is cool. So let's let's get a little weedy for a minute. Okay. Yeah. So okay, so now I'm going to go into the Azure portal. So. Okay. Um, here you can see on this first screen, I have a traffic manager provision. Yeah. Okay, now that's the service that's sitting in front of my API management gateways. Traffic manager, when you deploy it, it gets a DNS name, something, something, something dot traffic manager dot net. Okay, now nobody's going to want to query an API using right. um, that DNS name, right? That That's very difficult to work with. So for that, and this is the way traffic manager works, we use our domain name that we've acquired, in this case, AzureDemo.org or whatever domain name you happen to own, and you create a C name that points to that front end of that traffic manager. Love it. Now, all of a sudden, if you go to API.AzureDemo.org, voila, um, you're basically being sent to Azure Traffic Manager without using that really wonky um, DNS name, although maybe good for testing. Yeah, well. Now, what else are we doing here in Traffic Manager? Well, we're pointing it to some endpoints um, for the routing of traffic. In this case, these endpoints are the API management gateways, okay. West Europe and East US respectively. Traffic manager has to know where to send. So he's sending it there. Last thing I'll show on traffic manager before we move on is that I'm using the geographic routing method. There's a lot of routing methods yeah, there to are. choose from. <laughs> but the geographic routing method basically says, hey, if you're coming from this particular geography, I'm going to send you to an endpoint that's in closest proximity to that geography. Absolutely. So it keeps things um, kind of performant from that standpoint. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is great stuff so far. So if anybody's curious, those routing methods, absolutely, you can you can go introspect that in our documentation. It's all available on what it means to do geographic, what it means to do performance, what it means to do multi-value, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Traffic manager is a bit Swiss Army knife. In yeah, that. There's a lot of different routing methods that you can choose from to ultimately meet um, the technical requirements you have. Cool. So geographic in this case. Now, so we're kind of moving down the architecture from we went, looked at Azure DNS, we looked at Traffic Manager. Now we know Traffic Manager is sending traffic to Azure API Management. So in this case, I've got Azure API Management deployed. We can see that I have the premium tier of okay. Azure API Management, which amongst many things, allows me to replicate instances of my gateway to different parts of the world. So if I click on locations, you'll see I've got my gateway sitting in West Europe, yep. and you'll also see that I've got another instance of my gateway in East US. And this is like easy peasy. Now, you would want to do this through code, but let's say I wanted to replicate this to another yeah. part of the world. I click add. Okay. I choose the men, one of 60 plus regions that we have available. Yep. Um, I choose how many gateway units I want to have, which is kind of a performance throughput thing. Sure. And then I click add, and that's it. Azure API management will just make it be. That's how simple it is to put different instances of your gateway in different parts of the world. Now, uh, last piece we'll show here. 
is that you have to add APIs to API management in order for it to do <laughs> something. Otherwise, what's the Otherwise, point? What's the point yeah. right? So you've got the Echo API. That's the built-in API. Yep. Yep. You provision that service that comes with it, and that's kind of fun because you can test with that. The Echo API, for all intents and purposes, is basically a sanity check, right? Like, hey, I'm up and I'm running, and you can test Things are it. working. Yeah. Perfect. Good for guys like, like non-developers. <laughs> so Echo API is kind of fun to play with. So if you're using API management, you're like, how does it work? Echo API is built an API that you can use to kind of play with to better, you know, understand that and make it work. Awesome. So we've got an API added. I've called it my global API. There's um, a couple of things that I want to call out here. Um, the first is you'll notice I've got a couple of operations, a get and a host. So it's a very simple API. Um, and then secondarily, what I want to call out is that you can't really see it, but I created an inbound policy. So Azure API Management has an inbound processing policy, which can apply policies to traffic inbound to your API. As I can see from the highlight here, we've got backends, which are ultimately our APIs. You can apply policies to the backend. But then it's got an outbound processing policy that can be applied, which is traffic going back, kind of the request response. It's the response back to the requester. In this case, I created an inbound policy. So I'm going to click on this little policy code editor button. This gets a little tricky to see. Um, so hopefully, uh, if you're watching at home, you can zoom in um, or here, rewatch this. If why don't we do this? Let's see. I, I, I might there be able go. to do it here. There you go. Ah, OK. So basically, what this is doing is it's a policy that says, if you receive traffic on the gateway hosted in West Europe, huh? send it to the backend ID, which is essentially my function hosted on uh, my function hosted on function apps, yep. to my backend ID in West Europe. If I receive traffic on my East US gateway, send it to the backend ID of the function of the API ho hosted on my function app in East US. Okay. That's all this policy is really doing. Effectively, what we're seeing though is because this is it's 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 provisioned and then it's replicated. It doesn't necessarily have context to know where it's replicated to. It's just been provisioned to a particular region, and now it has to have some semblance of knowledge to say, I don't care where I am, but if the request is coming from here, put it here. Right, right. Yeah, that's kind of the power of this premium gotcha. here is I can choose where to replicate the gateway, okay. and then I can, in an inbound policy, say, hey, if you hit this gateway, send this traffic there. And that's kind of what this is doing. Okay. And then it's got, you know, an otherwise... Um, um, that's kind of like a default. categorization, like, like if then if all else happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the developer lingo there. Or uh, else, switch case default. <laughs> control, alt, delete. No. O2, that, that, line 10. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Print. Um, okay. So that's what this is doing. Okay. So that's kind of API management configured from an inbound policy level. Super important to, to do that if you're, you know, you have a design similar to the one that we just described. So now, one thing I want to call out here. Yeah. So from a developer's perspective, this is when we talk about configure to order versus build to order. Okay. I'm basically changing the configuration or I'm establishing the configuration that says, if here, do this, if here, do this, if here, do this, right? Instead right. of build to order where you hard code something or you put it as a variable in the code that says, um, I'm coming from here, do this, I'm coming from here, do this, right? So so effectively, you're not writing code and reprovisioning, you're just changing that configuration setting. So right. it, in the instance where you would add an additional gateway in a different region, yep. all you're going to do is you're going to go into that XML yep. um, document, you're right. going to add another uh, condition yep. that says, if you're here, do this, and right. you're without redeploying, without doing anything, you now have a configuration change, not a code change. Which is Yes, and what's nice is with the premium tier, that change applies as applies to all the gateways that you have deployed. Love it. So you're able to kind of configure that in one place. One other snippet that I, I neglected to mention that I will mention is that in order to receive traffic on api.azuredemo.org, that's a custom domain name. I need a custom certificate. Oh, that yes. Matches good those call. Requests. Good call. Otherwise, so you get that lovely error that says, yeah. it doesn't match the URL or the right. uh, common name or whatever it is. Nobody likes that. No. Oh. That's scary, kind of like yeah. you know, Friday the 13th. <laughs> so, so I've added a custom certificate. Um, basically, I'm using a certificate that's a wildcard certificate. That doesn't matter. Sure. But I've added, added a custom domain name and a certificate match. That has to be done on the API management uh, service to ensure that it succeeds the TLS handshake and, and you don't get the uh, certificate errors. Last piece to this is the function itself. So if we go to the function, it's this uh, HTTP trigger. So it's kind of waiting for an HTTP uh, REST command, um, if you will. And uh, when it receives that, it then executes. Um, this C sharp code. Nice. Okay, so this is a real basic um, API. It's not doing a whole lot. What it really does is it just uh, reports um, 
it gets an environment variable that I configured in the application settings okay. called Azure Region Name. Okay. Um, and then depending upon whether it's a get or a post, it returns a different response. Okay. I'm, I put all this in to ensure that I'm going to the right API hosted in the right region. So this is a little bit of due diligence from an IT guy, IT pro guy, who doesn't have a lot of developer depth, but knew enough to be dangerous. To uh, I would argue if even with developer depth, you want to do this to ensure it's trust but You want to make sure it's going to the right backend API. So this is ultimately kind of the test to validate that. So this is the last piece of the puzzle. So you need something to test querying the API. Okay. Like now, this. I use Postman. Okay, you might use other tools or services to query and test your API. And, and th at the end of the day, <clears throat> we're not saying one tool is better than the other one. You can use Fiddler, you can use Postman, you can actually use the command line and do a curl. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. It just so happens Postman is very friendly to use. You can use PowerShell. Yeah, absolutely. Both web request. There you go. Um, so Postman is it for me. Um, so in this case, you know, I've got Postman installed. So this is the desktop client. I just learned there's actually a web version of this, so you can do all of this inside your browser. I thought that was kind of <laughs> cool. Um, but I wanted to install it locally to make sure it was actually being sourced from my PC. So in this case, I've got um, my, my, um, my API configured. Um, in this case, I'm going to issue a post. I've got something in the request body that's needed in order for me to get something back from my post. So I'm going to go ahead and send the request. And we issue the request, we get the response back. Now, we're, we're seated here in yep. the Twin Cities, yes. right? Yes, yep, okay. we're in Minneapolis. So I would be, based upon the configuration of Traffic Manager, he would see that I am located in the Twin Cities and send me to the gateway that's closest to where I'm seated, which is going to be the gateway in East US. And then that gateway configuration in East US, based upon the inbound policy, says, oh, you hit the East US gateway, I'm going to send you to the function app hosted in East US, and voila. I can see, based upon the basic little testing that I've done with my C-sharp code is that it's returning back uh, the fact that I've routed to the uh, API that's hosted in East US. So this is kind of my validation that, hey, it's kind of working the way that I intended it to work. Sure. And that, soup to nuts, you know, kind of the flyover tour of what, yeah. what this uh, architecture was ultimately intended to deliver, a performant experience, um, and, and making sure that we've got uh, regional gateways sending traffic to regional APIs. That was uh, how it was set up and how we tested to validate it all works. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so um, there's a couple things to think about with Traffic Manager because there's other tools that may be able to handle this type of yeah. solution, right? right. Um, we've got Azure Front Door from a global perspective. Yep. If we're thinking about it more from a regional perspective, you may use something more akin to like App Gateway, App Gateway perhaps. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, one thing I want to make sure everybody understands, and I harp on this, right? So we did the dangling DNS episode, right? So first of all, yeah, that was the last one. I yeah, one of the things I would suggest is if you're using a Azure DNS, um, it's nice because um, uh, if you combine that with a private zone, for example, you don't see it's aliasing an Azure um, FQDN, right? Yes. And you kind of abstract that from people who are looking at being a nefarious actor. But one thing that you have to remember, or take into consideration, is traffic manager. Um, the upstream DNS servers, you need to, you, you can't necessarily rely on them honoring the, the TTL, right? Yeah. And that's not going to affect necessarily the performance situation, right. but if you're using it for failover, there's other products that might be better in a failover yeah. scenario versus something this like what true. you're doing, right? Yeah, when you're dealing with DNS, as many of you know, you're mm -hmm. dealing with time to live, yes. how long that record is cached. And you're sometimes dealing with caches that exceed the amount of time to live setting based right. upon how certain entities handle that. So that can lead to some unpredictability when you're expecting a DNS-based service to provide failover in the event of an endpoint becoming unavailable. Services like uh, uh, Azure Front Door um, tend to handle that a little bit better um, and have other features um, and have additional cost. But for some <laughs> cases, you know, that, that might be the best. Less is more. Uh, the buck. Or yeah, the buck maybe worth the bank. I don't know what that is. And, and you know, and realistically, when you're talking about, you know, failover versus performance, you have to, add, uh, I would say, introspect it at a service by service level. Yes. Because some of our services come with an alias and then a primary and a secondary. Right. So you can re just hit the alias and be done with it. And, right. and Azure, the Azure internals will actually uh, handle, the, handle the, the, the cutover and all that other stuff. Or... For example, if you don't want to wait for the alias to do that cutover, even if you've initiated a failover, you've got a primary and a secondary UR, FQDN. And so you can store them both or store one and say, hey, if this isn't responsive, go to my service locator pattern, look up tool, you know, whatever that is, and uh, hit that API, get the new FQDN back, and now you're talking to the new one. So there's definitely different ways that you can handle that. 
this absolutely fits the bill from a performance perspective yeah. right? because it's geo aware it's not meant for failover and i mean those could be cached in perpetuity um as long as that endpoint exists right. you're good to go yep awesome that's it that is excellent 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 so um how long did it take, just out of curiosity, how long did it take for you to build this? Um, so I tend to build a lot of stuff by hand as I'm learning and then redeploy by code once I've kind of got a good, my sea legs underneath me. Um, but to deploy this in totality, we're probably talking maybe, I don't know, two hours. Awesome. Yeah, it doesn't take terribly long. Replicating the gateways take a little bit of time. So there's some kind of stop and starts with that, but... No, this 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 is a complete in one day thing. Even if you're learning and demonstrate it back or whatever it is that you're doing with this, it, it you can do this amazingly fast. Awesome, and you know to to that point, and some one of my coworkers, one of my peers, Simon Kurtz, will tell you that, that the APM deployment does take a little bit. It does, you know? yeah. So you have to you have to kind of factor that in when you're thinking about you know disaster recovery, um, high availability, those kinds of right, things. right. So, yep, dude, that's awesome. That is a great demo. Um, that's what you would see in the real world. This is this is a real world scenario. Absolutely. And we do see. I know it, it seems it seems unrealistic, but yeah, we do see global deployments. We see a lot of customers that have their customers, you know, or their end users in multiple regions. You know, this is we yeah. have a global economy. We have it's right. what we're dealing with. And I think everybody aspires to have that active active our absolutely you yeah. know where you're deployed in multiple parts of the world and you're performant everywhere and you've got resiliency built in and this kind of harmonizes towards that charter so absolutely. um so yeah so i hope this was informative um i hope you get something out of it great stuff um i've got some of the c-sharp code on my github page um and uh, i'll publish more of this infrastructure stuff on that as well so if this is something that you have interest in certainly look there um matt lunzer is my my github username so um, as, or you can reach read, out separately. as you can read right down there. Oh, yes, yes, so yes. Matt yes. Lunder, if you're looking for that GitHub, GitHub repo. Awesome. <laughs> now, just wait. There's more, right? Are we talking New Year's resolutions? No, we're oh, talking okay. just when you thought we were done with the show and couldn't possibly fill your brain with any more really ridiculously useful information. Matt's got more information. Oh, 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 we're doing the, uh, oh, the VM stop start. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Well, wow. Okay. Uh -huh. Let, let's go ahead and, and flip back to our lovely display where we show Matt in action. All right. That's pretty cool. I, um, I always love to see people with an infra bias. I won't say background because your background is spans tons of stuff, security, I'm infrastructure. An yeah, I'm but I love to see people doing this kind of stuff because it's a brave new world. And if you are a cloud architect in any way, shape, or form, you are going to need to learn a, a scripting language, a coding language, whatever it is, right? Or a tool like Terraform, or this is just the nature of the new world order when it comes to cloud. So this is awesome. I wish everybody took it upon themselves to approach the world like this. Yes, yes. Well, um, I think it's kind of incumbent upon those with infrastructure backgrounds to take on scripting language, um, perhaps learn to code. Um, at least enough to, 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 you know, be dangerous, so to speak. And this is somewhat of an example of that. So this is a real simple problem statement, right? Awesome. I love I it. Virtual machines that I deploy to test or to deploy things onto. Um, now, you can actually shut those virtual machines off okay. when they're not in use and save money. Okay. Or, you know, make them impenetrable, right? They're, they're awesome. off, so they're not something that's uh, exposed Boy, yeah. and available for... Yeah. Nefarious actors. Exploit the cloud and protect the and exploit the cloud. Protect take advantage the cloud. of the protections. Yeah, absolutely. So this is pretty simple. So okay. now Azure Functions support different languages. The one absolutely. that I just demonstrated with Azure API Management was, was a, a C sharp function. Yeah. This one is written in PowerShell, which, okay. which actually is a little closer to my heart. So <laughs> a little bit better. We won't hold it um, against you. We won't hold it. Against you. <laughs> PowerShell. Now is that a scripting yeah, or love. a development? What, that would, what, what, I would consider PowerShell more of a command line interface type of uh, okay. language. Now, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Everybody's, it's, it is a bit of a religious uh, conversation, but. Yeah. So this is, this is super simple, guys. Anybody can do this, even on, at an IT pro. But basically here in this case, I've got a PowerShell function that starts my virtual machines. Sure. Okay. So it does um, a get AZVM, select object name. So it's basically getting all of the virtual machines that I have in my subscription. And then it's doing a for each loop. And then effectively, if it uh, um, finds a virtual machine, it then does a get AZVM and it starts that virtual machine. Nice. Okay. Now you need to have this 
you can manually trigger this. Mm -hmm. um, this one happens to be a timer trigger. Okay. So, you know, I've got a cron schedule set up to do this in the morning. So when I wake up in the morning and have a coffee and a cigarette while I'm doing that, <laughs> um, while I'm doing that, the virtual machines Holy are being started. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Now, at the end of the day, I don't tend to moonlight a whole lot, although sometimes I work after hours. Sure. But I have a, another corresponding function that does kind of the exact same thing, but it does it a little bit differently. So, um, as you can imagine from the start VM um, uh, PowerShell uh, function, in this case, it's actually getting all the virtual machines, and then it's looking at the resource tags okay. that are assigned to those virtual machines. And if it happens to have a resource tag that is configured um, with shutdown equals true, ah. it then stops that virtual machine. Okay. Okay. At uh, according to the schedule, if it okay. doesn't have shutdown equals true, then that virtual machine continues to run. So that would be for like you know I plan to work that night on something because I'm tinkering or maybe I've got homework I've got to do. Uh, in that case, I keep the virtual machine running. And this much like the other one then, and I'm just kind of scrolling through the code a little bit, and I've got this out on GitHub too. Um, but but it's pretty simple stuff. I mean, if you understand PowerShell and simple for each loops and things of that nature, that's effectively what this is doing, um, with some 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 little bit of added complexity there to extract the uh, resource tag and act upon that. And then this one, much like the the uh, start VM timer, is also based on a timing trigger and shuts things off at the end of the day. Awesome. That's effectively what this does. So this is kind of another use case of using an Azure function if you're an IT professional. Um, with PowerShell to actually perform an automated action against some of your resources that you might otherwise do manually. So moving up the stack a little bit, deploying a serverless function service and writing a little bit of code or a script or a CLI language, whatever you term it, um, <laughs> to perform some actions that I would normally do manually and have to remember to do. Um, and by doing so, make sure that it happens consistently on a daily basis. And I save because I'm not running these VMs in the after hours when they're not being used. Absolutely. So efficiency use of the cloud. hundred percent. You get everybody knows that that's my fourth tenant, right? Is exploit the cloud. If you, you're not exploiting, you're not done from a cost right. perspective, from a capabilities perspective. Until you're exploiting and getting more out of it, then you it's put kind into of a it. continuous loop, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're always interrogating ways to do things more efficiently and to save more money. Hundred percent agree. Actually, a thousand percent if that's a thing. Wow. Thousand percent. Awesome. That's big. That's so, a big agreement. So this has been an incredible demo. I mean, both of these have been awesome, dude. Seriously, I mean. The, again, the thing I like about Drop it, in the mic. yeah, the thing I like about it is these are real world things that people deal with. Now, you know, we do have capabilities to start and, or to shut down VMs at least, yeah. right? but you still have to do a, a turn on, right? That was why I did this. Yeah. Yeah. Another great exactly example right. is with Azure Event Hub, right? You can auto inflate, but there's no such thing as auto deflate on Azure Event Hub. So if you scale your, if you, if you have your Azure Event Hub set to auto inflate and it actually in, uh, provisions more throughput units. Well, you don't want it running like that in perpetuity because you're paying for it, right? So let's say you're a retailer, you're past Cyber Monday, mm -hmm. you want to now start bringing it in. Right, dial it How back. would you do that? Azure Functions would be a great way to do that if you're so inclined to, to script it and automate it and, and turn it into something that it's a click of a button or it's timer-based or whatever. So um, these are real-world scenarios, especially the APM situation. I love that demo. And I mentioned Simon Kurtz already, but I'm going to mention him again. Um, been working with him on uh, effectively a zero trust implementation for App Gateway, APIM, and now I think we got to go back to the drawing board and think. Of, and and I think we were talking about having Traffic Manager or Front Door in there, but if we're not, we I'd like really to try should, this yeah yeah. So you may see a future Matt, episode. You may see Matt Lunder's name as a contributor to that source code repo here pretty soon, just as an FYI. Just PowerShell contribution. <laughs> awesome. Well, Matt, you know, again, you're a reoccurring member, if not a, a, a regular on the show. So um, I obviously we love it when you come and talk. Um, where can people you reach you if they have questions, if they've got, you know, what sure. are your contacts? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, so, yeah, Matt Lunzer, matt.lunzer at Microsoft.com. I'm also on uh, LinkedIn. Awesome. Um, and Matt Lunzer is my GitHub. So. Excellent. And if you have any questions about the show, about the content, um, Hopefully no gripes, but if you do, how we can make the show better, um, you can always reach me at Rick, W-E-Y, at Microsoft.com. Or, of course, I do monitor the Twitter feed, all that stuff. You know, Azure Flash News, look for us on YouTube. You know, hit the hit the like and subscribe stuff. We, you know, this is, we do it for you. Um, and if there's something that you're interested in, hit us up. We, we love talking about this stuff. Or if you might have an example of something that you've done, we love guests. <laughs> and you don't have to be in Minneapolis. I'm sure we can figure out a way with 
with the MTC. Genius is here, Corey Buzzle, and, and some of the other folks on how to how to make that happen. Um, and we do have to give a big, big, big thanks to the, to the MTC for Absolutely. letting us host the show, for helping us produce it. Um, obviously, we were on sabbatical for a while when the when the pandemic stuff kind of hit, and we did some work, but. Um, you know, we couldn't do it without him. So just absolutely thank you to Corey and team for making this happen. And to the rest of you, thank you so much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. You know that um, without you, we aren't here. Um, and my last thing, of course, is, you know, for what it's worth, always, always, always keep those fingers on the keyboards, but keep your head in the cloud. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.